Our guest is House Majority Leader Delegate Eric Kalsolder. E, good morning to you. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you guys doing? What do you recommend for Mr. Gilstrap? Well, I think it could be just a run capacitor. And also, uh, the misconception is that we're putting cold air into your house. No, we're, we're, AC is removing heat. So that's why you get that that coolness feeling. So we're removing heat out of your house. That's the whole principle of how air conditioning yeah. works. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Y- yeah, because yeah. I've, over the vent, yes. you feel cool air. Because the absence of heat. We're, we're pulling that warm, heated air through that coil. The whole direct expansion of that coil, what happens is that refrigerant starts outside in the air conditioning unit, and it goes in the little line. It come, and it travels all the way to your air handler, and it hits a little tiny orifice or an expansion valve, and that gas, that liquid expands to a gas. And as it expands, it starts circulating through that coil, and you're bringing warm air across that coil. That refrigerant is absorbing that heat and taking that heat back down to big line and taking it outside and rejecting the heat outside. So your evaporator is on the inside, your condenser is on the outside in a cooling cycle mode. So kind of weird and when it breaks yeah, like gill straps <laughs> did what happens then you have nothing yeah. so yeah the some of the uh yeah, the thing that makes noise behind the walls what you have yeah some <laughs> what you want to do john when you get home today yeah. sometime today put it on fan on or fan on just to see if your indoor unit will work if your indoor if your indoor unit is working then there's a problem with your outdoor unit so could be something simple like a run capacitor Okay. So. Or a flux capacitor. <laughs> That's different. That's yeah, different. Yeah. Well, the run capacitor gives your compressor more torque to start because the tor- the starting amperage of that compressor, that's that's what your run capacitor does. So, but uh, Recently, and you heard it in our open, Attorney General Patrick Morrissey, who previously ran for Senate, almost didn't quite beat Joe Manchin, uh, has declared himself a candidate for governor. Polls which he's, I believe he's sponsored, or a PAC that supports him sponsored, has him in uh, first place among those who would be running for governor. Absolutely. Uh, Eric, your thoughts on this? My thoughts were, when I was emceeing his event, his announcement, when Patrick Morrissey came out and said the word hello, the race was over. I mean, that's how strong of a candidate Patrick Morrissey is going to be. I mean, he is the only conservative in the race. Uh, my good friend, uh, obviously, J.B. McCuskey, um, uh, Moore Capito, but Patrick Morrissey, I mean, he's Mac been, Warner, Mac Warner, all great people, all good uh, Republicans. But uh, I mean, the, the the accomplishments that Patrick Morrissey has under his belt is just phenomenal. And I think he would be a very good governor for the state of West Virginia. I'm endorsing Patrick Morrissey just like I'm endorsing Alex Mooney. And I know the, the big heavyweight, the governor, I still say that Alex Mooney is going to be able to pull this off. Now, I know the governor is well liked and the governor has not announced yet. But I do believe that Alex Mooney can pull this off. It will be the ups, uh, the upset. Alex doesn't lose elections. He does not lose elections, and he's a strong. And remember, state of West Virginians are looking for strong conservative fighters, and you got two: Alex Mooney and, and Patrick Morrissey. And you've heard me say for the last 13 years, you're going to see more and more representation out of the Eastern Panhandle that's going to serve in U.S. Senate roles, Congress, the governorship. I mean. We're growing by leaps and bounds, and we're having more and more conservative fighters. You know, I, I, we had a lot of good conservative fighters down there this year. Mike Height and Mike Hornby, they were uh, great guys. How did our boys do down there? They did very well. They, they, uh, I was very impressed with both both of them. They did great on committees, and uh, they did they did great job. In fact, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, I saw where their polling came out or their their little scorecard. Both of them scored 100%. So mm-hmm. kudos to those two. They did did a really good job. It's fascinating because I've seen two different scorecards. One was done by a very conservative group. Uh, another done by the Chamber of Commerce, who yes. is widely regarded as being, uh, obviously they're pro-business, yes. and widely regarded as a Republican organization. Uh, and uh, <coughs> uh, different delegates uh, who were scored out of the Eastern Panhandle finished Differently, depending on which which organization was doing that. Yeah, this wasn't a score on conservatism. This was a score on how pro-business you are. Right, which is and, generally associated with conservatism. Yes, it is. It is. But there were some key votes, obviously, that some conservatives uh, maybe missed the mark on and didn't score very highly. Uh, but for the most part, all of us in the Eastern Panhandle scored 100%. So for, very happy. Form Energy was form a energy. dividing line for some of the more conservative uh, groups that were uh, scorecarding delegates. Yes. Uh Tell me where you saw as the split there between 
conservatism and pro-business when it came to Form Energy. Well, and keep in mind, here's here's the dilemma with Form Energy. I, I know a lot of people want to blame the legislature for Form Energy, but keep in mind, it was the executive branch that brought Form Energy to West Virginia. The only question that was put before the legislature was a supplemental appropriation of $115 million, of which $10 million was for broadband expansion and $105 million for Form Energy. Now, looking at the, the, the strong lean interest uh, uh, security that the state had, I think it was a no-brainer. I mean, the whole Republican platform is to lower taxes, cut spending, and create jobs. And, and that's basically, that's the vote that we took. And uh, now there are some naysayers that will say, hey, look, uh, we're giving away a lot to uh, Form Energy. But keep in mind, Form Energy has to build over a 9,000 square foot building. They have to have $350 million investment in equipment. They have to prove to us that they can manufacture and sell a 500 megawatt battery. Okay, They're going to pay us rent monthly. They have to create 750 jobs. They have to do all this within five years. And if they don't, it all reverts back to the state of West Virginia. So it's a good deal for the state. So. The hang up there was that a lot of the more conservative folks mm -hmm. felt that the government should not be involved in investing for a corporation. I think you guys were called fascists at one point. We were. We were called everything. But keep in mind, if we're trying to create jobs and bring in new new facilities, look, the growing trend of West Virginia, we're losing population. If we don't soon reverse that population loss, what's going to happen? You're going to start losing more representation at the, at the uh, congressional level. So we need to do something. And I think this year we had a great year at the legislature. We did a lot of great things. We had historic tax cuts. I mean, we're still focusing on economic development, and you're going to see more economic development. In fact, I have a list of just major economic development uh, that we brought to the state, like Nucor, Commercial Metals, CMC Metals over here in Falling Waters, Berkshire Hathaway, Precision Cast Parts, Owens & Minor, Form Energy, Pure Watercraft, Green Power, uh, Paper Mettler, they're up in Moorfield, and uh, Mountaintop Beverage. So. We're doing a lot of good things in West Virginia. You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, I know that 99% uh, of the things that we're doing, everybody's happy about that one-tenth of a percent. Keep in mind, if, you, if your mantra is to get rid of Republicans who voted for Form Energy, you're only one legislative session away from uh, eliminating that Republican majority. Is that what you really want? I mean, all the good things like Hope Scholarship, school choice, historic tax cuts, uh, repeal of prevailing wage, uh, right to work. All that would be gone in an eye blink under a Democrat majority. So don't fool yourself. I mean, we're doing a lot of good things, and we're moving it as fast as we can. You mentioned the tax cuts. Those are based on uh, the ones that, are, that could kick in in the future are based on economic triggers. And these are things that aren't understood by the majority of people who mention them, including me. Yes. So tell me what these economic triggers are and how they work. All right. So I wrote myself a little scenario so I could sound somewhat uh, reasonable over the radio. And so we'll talk about the triggers and, and, and then we'll get into the practical use. How do the triggers actually work? Now, the triggers are written in a way that prevents the growth of the state's base uh, general revenue budget in real terms. Okay, what does re in real terms mean? That means it takes into account for inflation. So it does allow the budget to keep pace uh, with inflation. For example, it allows for a 5% pay raise if you have 5% inflation. All right, but it does not allow for the overall growth in the size of government. So uh, any real growth in the size of government would require an equal cut. Uh, from the budget somewhere, okay? That's the main takeaway from some of the triggers. But the reason uh, for this is the triggers are written. The triggers do not use an all growth in revenues to trigger PIT cuts, and it's an important uh, description here. So the triggers do not use all growth in revenues to trigger the PIT cuts. It just uses the growth in revenues that goes above and beyond the rate of inflation. Does that make sense? So if the if the rate of inflation is 5%, you would have to have growth in the budget of, in excess, of revenues in excess of 5% to trigger the... Exactly. Excess. So, for example, if revenues grow 5% and you have 5% inflation, then there's no trigger. No you're, you're going to go by the federal definition of inflation, Yes. Right? Not yes. state inflation, federal That's inflation. right, by the BLS. So 
uh, so the triggers don't occur if there's 5% growth, 5% inflation. But uh, let's assume that there is a 8% revenue growth and we have 5% in inflation. Then that 3% will trigger a PIT cut. Okay. Of how much? Of 3%. Okay. So we're just going above and beyond what the inflation rate is. Okay. Now, earlier, a second ago, I said, hey, look, it, it's designed not to allow your base budget to grow, but there could be a situation where your overall base budget could grow if the overall growth exceeds the 10% of the triggers that we put in, in, the, uh, in the bill. For instance, most of our growth is about 1% to 3% per year in, in the state budget. But the whole axiom of economic theory is if you want more of something, you tax less of it. So we're going to put economic theory to test with this whole trigger process. So let's just say, for, in, uh, for instance, that you were able to achieve 20% revenue growth, okay? Well, you're going to get your 10% cut. So if you had a, if you had a general revenue budget of like $5.396 billion and you saw 20% revenue growth, you're looking at an additional growth of like one billion seventy nine million. I mean, that would be huge. Okay, mm -hmm. so you would get your ten percent personal income tax cut because of the trigger. That's it, that roughly equates to about eight hundred or two hundred and fifty million dollars. So that would still leave about eight hundred and some odd million left. So the legislature would have a decision to make. Would the could the legislature decide to use that eight hundred million dollars uh, to make? Uh, 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 budget adjustments, it could, okay. Could they use it to further tax relief? They could. Or could they use it to uh, increase their overall base general revenue budget? They could. So that, that would be a decision of how or what the legislature would have to make if you saw exponential growth, okay, because of economic theory. Okay. So that's that's the whole trigger. Now, how do they actually work? Okay, here's the nuts and here's the whole mechanics can, of can it. Can I jump in there? Yeah, real yeah, quick? yeah. What, what if, what if, um, Revenues are less than inflation. Okay. Well, guess what? No what? cuts. No cuts. It, no cuts. So it, it doesn't. It doesn't right. go backwards. It just yeah. goes forward. Right. That's right. It, no tax could, increases. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now there could be a time if we have a recessionary period, you're not going to see any tax cuts. Okay. But if you see revenue growth and no inflation, you're going to see tax cuts. If you see revenue growth that exceeds inflation, you're going to see tax cuts. So. It, that which means a cut in services no no or they'll have to do they'll have to no no because for instance uh, let's say you had revenue growth of eight percent right okay and you have five percent inflation you're only going to get a three percent income tax cut right okay that still leaves you five percent to do any budget adjustments that you're going to need or uh, pay raises if you want or you could make some type of uh, additional tax cuts, whatever that may be. You know, I've heard uh, on this show people ask about the marriage penalty and so mm -hmm. forth. You know, the marriage penalty, the cut for the marriage penalty is about $115, $120 million. Okay. Um, but I'm of the mindset that you would be better off to buy down. There's five income tax brackets that we currently have. You would be better off to take that $115, $120 million and reduce the rates. Because as you reduce the rates, obviously you're reducing the marriage penalty. And once you eliminate the rates, guess what? There's no marriage penalty. So you'd be further off. I believe you would be better off to just go ahead and reduce the rates across the board additionally. Well, uh, go ahead. So if, if the, the, the governor sets the revenue projections. The revenue estimates, yes. Is, is there any way that that can be manipulated to reduce the ability to taxes let's say we no. get a, a different you know, we have a different governor right, right. they, they uh, well here's here's the nuts and bolts of it because remember you're just going after the revenues that exceed above and beyond the growth of inflation so here's the mechanics of how it all works okay thanks to joe manchin um you know most states wanted to start cutting income tax rates across the nation okay so congress said okay in 2019 that's your base year you can't have revenue. You've got to have revenues exceed the 2019 base year. Okay, if you don't, and and you implement tax re, uh, reform, there could be clawback provisions. So the starting point with all this discussion is our 2019 base general revenue year. Okay, 
So that number has been already established. Because, and then they take the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, for 2019. It just so happens that the Consumer Price Index for 2019 was 253.268. So now that the bill is written, we have these triggers. What will tax do every year moving forward? Well, around August of uh, every year moving forward, tax will take a look at the CPI that's uh, calculated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, usually done around mid-July, okay? They'll take that CPI number, you take the current CPI number, and you divide it into the existing 2019 CPI number, all right? And that'll give you a multiplier. So in my little example that I was gonna talk about on the radio this morning, I'm suggesting that for fiscal year 23, and I'm making this up, the CPI would be 296.126. So you take that 296.126 and you divide that into the uh, prior, the fiscal year 2019 uh, CPI of 253.268, you get a multiplier, and that multiplier is 1.169, okay? And all that multiplier would represent would be for during those five years, uh, there was about a 17% inflation, okay? So that multiplier, that 1.169, you multiply that by your base uh, year 2019 general revenue. So you take that 1.169, you multiply it by the 2019 base general revenue minus any severance taxes because they didn't want any volatility in the severance tax. And that will give you the adjusted general revenue growth. Okay. All right, now... So at moving forward, all you have to do is take a look at your current budget estimate, okay? And if it exceeds the adjusted gross, re uh, the adjusted, uh, uh, gross revenue from 2019, then you're gonna get a tax cut. If it's less than the adjusted gross, uh, 2019, you're not gonna get a tax cut. So that's the mechanics of how it works and how it prevents the growth in size of government. Remember, it's all hinging off of inflation. All right. Mm -hmm. So who's in charge of doing all the math, Eric? Uh, the legislature. Uh, now you're tax commissioner. Tax so, commissioner. Yeah, and but like I said, it's a simple mathematical formula. You take the current CPI, you divide it into the 2019 CPI, you get that multiplier. All you have to do is take that multiplier and multiply it by, and you can write this figure down because this is what the 2019 general revenue budget was minus the severance. You take. Four billion, so four comma two nine three comma eight eight four comma seven five four. That was the revenue that year. That was the revenue for that year, and the CPI for that year was two five three point two six eight. So all you have to do is take the the current CPI divided by that uh, two thousand nineteen CPI. You get the multiplier, multiply it by that uh, general revenue number. That will give your adjusted gross uh, revenue. And then moving forward, if you're higher than the adjusted, you're going to get a tax cut. If you're lower, you're not. Easy peasy. So is, is this... Go cut me a switch, young man. Is, is this formula something that's already been in place from other states that have done this? Or did you and Eric Tarr and a bunch of other people no, get together and come up with this? No, I've been working with Dave Hardy and uh, Mark Muko for mm -hmm. the last several months. I mean, this this it, actually, this income tax cut is much better than what the what the governor proposed. If you remember, the governor proposed a 30% first year, 10%, 10%. It was a 50% tax cut, and that was it, okay? Every tax cut, income tax cut bill that I had ever did, I always had some, some form or some type of triggers to get us to reduce the income tax to a certain point. So I believe with this, uh, this proposal that we actually passed is much better than what the governor had proposed. And in fact, I think that's why you heard less out of the governor once he realized the power of the triggers and how it will eventually get us to what the common goal is, is to eliminate the personal income tax. Mm -hmm. That's why you saw the governor that was on board. Now, the whole dynamics of how we actually came up with the 21.25%, if you're actually interested, um, during that whole discussion there at the mansion, uh, we were the House and the Senate. We were meeting with the governor, with the executive branch, and um, I had mentioned to uh, Senate President Blair. I said, "Let's just go with 25% personal income tax cuts, and then we'll just trigger everything else after it. All the Amendment Two stuff that you want, and everything else." 
And uh, I believe Craig almost said yes, but at that point when I said that and Craig almost said yes, the governor reaches his hand out and he puts his right hand on Speaker Hanshaw's head and reaches his left hand out and uh, touches Craig Blair and said, let's go back to the library and uh, let's have a talk. So I'm sitting out there now by myself with a couple of the staffers from the executive branch. So the governor, the speaker, and the Senate president, they go back into the library. And uh, they're back here for 10 or 15 minutes. I have no idea what they're talking about. When they, but when they come back out, that's when they said, okay, we're going to do it at 21.25%. I said, good deal. I'll take it. And they said, we're going to allow you to do that. the triggers householder. I said, absolutely, good deal. I'll take it. So everything else to me was ancillary. I mean, the Amendment 2 stuff. I mean, this tax cut bill is over $754 million. Uh, the Senate wanted some... Uh, they wanted the rebate because obviously the governor had talked about it out there when he uh, adamantly opposed uh, Amendment 2. So you've got the rebate system. So if you pay your taxes starting in January 1, 2024, if you pay your personal property taxes on time, you get a 100% refundable tax credit. Okay. But the caveat is you must pay them on time. All right. So, mm -hmm. and then when you file your taxes in 25, if you paid your taxes on time, your your personal property taxes, you'll get a 100% refundable tax credit. So if you had $1,400 in personal property tax liability and you only had $1,000 in personal income tax, well, that $1,400 will go against that $1,000 and you'll get a sweet $400 back to your name because it's a dollar for dollar refundable tax credit. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I heard that from Dave Hardy on the radio that, yeah. that you shouldn't pay – this just this year only you shouldn't pay your pp taxes uh, in full in september you should pay half year you can you can yeah but because the look back period only goes to like january 1st of right. 2024 so right. if you pay early all up front then you won't you, you'll lose half of you'll lose you'll lose your ability to get uh, it back get get yeah. that back and that's just a one year like snag yeah the only caveat too is that you must pay it on time now there's times that i haven't paid it on time i mean i've like most people they're they're probably not paying until oh dear lord i need a little sticker on my license plate or whatever the situation may be you know what i mean uh but obviously you're paying interest if you're paying late but uh if you do pay it on time you get a 100 percent refundable tax credit well, I, well hold on matt we okay. need to do a commercial break here we're a little bit past our halfway point with the house majority leader delegate eric householder to some in studio with jefferson county prosecuting attorney matt harvey new york times best-selling author john gilstrap and west virginia house majority leader delegate eric householder and uh, i'm not sure how much more math will be involved in this segment but i'm alerting you along the way to get out your slide rules calculators <laughs> and friends who are good at math to bring this along with you we're heading into the break matt harvey you had a question you were about to ask you had several questions one he asked me about the cpi right well, well yeah. um i forgot what i was going to ask what would we talk about off air well we talked about how your paycheck grew oh yeah yeah, yeah. I, I did want to mention that that i have seen uh you know a noticeable amount with the the new tax withholding tables that my my paycheck has gotten bigger yes the withholding tables are in effect so if you're an employee working for someone you should see a larger paycheck so and if the, if your employer hasn't adapted to the new uh tax tables yet Really, and you're going to get it back in the end anyway because yes. this goes back to back dates to January one. It's retroactive back to January one. And I think Rob, you asked me what is CPI, Consumer Price Index, John asked John, that. or John did. Okay, so remember, Consumer Price Index is just a measure of goods and services over the previous year's goods and services to find out, you know, is there inflation? So if West Virginia was a, um, let's just say West Virginia was a uh, two uh, goods state. They produce good X and good Y. Okay, so in 2022, good X was $10 and good Y was $8. So that's $18, right? And then 23, they found out that good X was $12 and good Y was, uh, um, say, $10. Okay, now you're seeing that the total of those goods have obviously risen. So now it's just a division and uh, if you had 18 over 22, whatever that mathematically works out, you'll have a number like a 1.77 or something like that. That's so the, the 2019 CPI number that you yes. that I wrote down is 253.268. Yes. What are those units? What does that 
that's of all goods and services in the whole United States. I think it, it's. Does it uh, subtract fuel and uh, food? Uh, well, it, it's like because there's two I, different indices they use for those. Yeah, they're using the. Uh, I think it's the CPIU. It's all urban. All it's. It's what's 93 percent of what the CPI is based off of, and that is that number in 2019. So. So it's an index number? I'm just trying to figure out, is it 253.26%? Yeah, no, it's 2.53. It? In other words, what cost $100 last year cost $102.53 this year. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. So and then when you divide the previous to the current, that's how you get the multiplier. And that multiplier, like I mentioned in my case, was 1.169. Well, that, that represents 16.9% inflation. So that's what you're using it for to check inflation. Not going to hold you to it, obviously. Yeah. But when do you anticipate a trigger or tr- or triggers being met? I think you're going to see the trigger being met every year. It's going to put us on a path to eliminate the personal income tax, uh, providing you know once again that you're seeing that you're seeing inflation. Okay, you could have zero inflation. Could there be a possibility that you may not see any tax cut? Possibly. For instance, if you had zero inflation and your revenue growth was only one percent, yeah, you're not you're not going to see. Uh, but the whole economic theory is that if you want more of something, right, you, you tax less of it. So we're going to put economic theory to the test. Uh, I predict that uh, you're going to see a revenue growth. That's the whole question. Will you see revenue growth in the state of West Virginia from cutting in- income tax? Well, the answer is yes. I mean, we've seen it federally, you know, nationally. We've seen income tax cuts produce more revenue growth. And uh, I think you're going to see income tax cuts every year. Could they be as high as 10%? Possibly. But they could only be 2 or 3 4 or 5%. And 10% is the cap. 10% is the cap, yes. So Per year? Per year, yes. So, you know, one of the reasons why I thought it was a sweet deal, I know the the 50% that the, that the governor proposed that the House passed early on, uh, this proposal that's that's before us today, that's now law, it just takes an extra year, and it has triggers that allow us to reduce and eliminate the uh, income tax cut, and that's what's positive. That's going to put more money in people's mm-hmm. pockets. It's going to spur economic growth, and that's what we're hoping. Eric, if you keep sliding right, you're going to slide right uh, out of the uh, picture. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, slide left, my yeah, man. Slide yeah. left. I'm trying to look over at Matt. You know. Hey, do you have the March revenue numbers yet? I do have the March revenue numbers. So March, at the end of March. Our personal income tax exceeded uh, the monthly estimates by $48 million. Uh, The consumer sales tax exceeded monthly estimates by $22 million. The severance tax exceeded our monthly estimates by $64 million. And our corporate net income tax exceeded monthly estimates by $15 million. So we estimated March collections to be 358 million. We actually brought in 517 million. So we had a surplus of 158 million for the month of, for the month of March. So that brings us to a total surplus of 1.266 billion dollars with three months to go. Now, if you remember in my little tax equation, I said uh, when we talked about the triggers. If you saw exponential growth, well, here's a prime example of exponential growth, okay? Um, If you see revenues exceeding 20%, in my little example, 20% of a $5.3 billion budget was like $1 billion. So if we're on target of getting $1.2 billion, well, you would get a $250 million tax cut, and the other $800 million, the state would have to use it for something for further tax cuts to uh, base budget or to grow their base budget if they wanted to. Now, that you're likely to wind up with a revenue surplus of 1.7, 1.8 billion yes. at the end of the year. Yes. So this pretty much locks in another 10% income tax cut for next year. It, it does. But keep in mind, the budget, the 24 budget that we just passed, we put $1.1 billion in the back of the budget in the rev- general revenue surplus section of the budget, okay? So of that $1.1 billion, I did lock up $400 million into an income tax reserve fund to protect us if, in case anything were to go awry. If there's a shortfall, therefore if you don't have to raise taxes, you can right. take it out of the surplus. Right, but it also... Is I, that separate from the rainy day fund? It is, it is, but it also you know, protects us from uh, spending, because that's now four hundred million that can't be spent for some other frivolous program or some social program that one of us may not agree with. Okay, so it locks it up, 
puts it in personal income tax fund. It's used uh, if anything were to go awry or for future tax cuts. And I mean, I'm a proponent of limited government, smaller government. And that's what I tried to do by limiting the size, the growth in size of government by having these triggers the way that we uh, um, orchestrated it. So let me throw this out here. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And we've talked on this show and you hear in the news all the time that we have too few prison guards. We need police officers and firefighters and teacher yes. pay and all this. Why? How is it not a good idea to take all of that money, billions of dollars, mm-hmm. and spend it on prison guards and police officers and firefighters? You still will have that ability, John, because in my example where if you had 8% revenue growth, and you had 5% inflation, I said you, you would only see a 3% PIT cut. So that leaves you 5% that you could use to uh, compensate salaries for prison guards or to hire more people if you wanted to or make any other budget uh, adjustment that you wanted to or further tax cuts. So you do have some room. Remember, the maximum tax cut, I, I keep saying $250 million, but in reality, that 10% number right now is around 250 but as your general revenue budget increases that 250 million does increase a little bit you know each and every time because it's 10 percent. so uh, i'm hoping that this doesn't sound too confusing coming across the radio but it's really simple once again you just take whatever the current cpi rate is and you divide that into the 2019 cpi rate and that gets you a multiplier and that 2019 is going to be the anchor from yes. now on. From now on, go, moving forward into the future until personal income tax is, is eliminated. And that will give you a multiplier. So once you divide it out, you get a multiplier. And you just take that multiplier and multiply it to whatever the general revenue budget was in 2019 that I just stated on air. And that gives you your adjusted general revenue budget. And you just Write that down, and then every year moving forward, if your current revenue budget exceeds your adjusted, you're going to get a tax cut. If it doesn't, you're not going to see a tax cut. So, how real are the the revenue estimates? I mean, if these numbers were reversed, somebody would be really in trouble, right? Because they, they they blowing the estimates by a lot. So, is there a thumb on the scale during the the revenue estimates that then kind of give us a surplus that's not? It's, it's more a math problem than an actual surplus. I mean, we could we could be budgeting to make one dollar and then have, you know, a much larger uh, surplus than we do. Yeah, and here's a prime example of what we just actually went through this, and that's why we contemplated it. Say you had another COVID shutdown, like we did a couple years ago, where everything shut down, but then our energy sector just started seeing phenomenal exponential growth. Okay. And where we were seeing huge uh, re- returns at the state level because of uh, coal prices and, and, and gas prices, energy prices went through the roof. So one of the things that we compl- uh, contemplated was to take severance tax out because severance taxes are volatile. And you don't want to include that in your general revenue budget because it could get you in the situation where, eh, look, you're cutting taxes and you've got this artificial increase of, of severance tax that could uh, put you in a bad situation. So we contemplated that. We took it out. That's one reasons why um, I think it was best that we did take out the severance tax. It's not in the equation. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to see some type of tax relief. So now the tax cuts also, besides the personal income tax cut, uh, it does have um, another caveat was not only the vehicle rebate, but also if you're a service veteran with 90 uh, percent or higher disability you get a hundred percent refundable tax credit for your homestead exemption okay so 100 percent. so if you're a service veteran out there with a service rated disability of 90 percent or higher you're going to get a 100 percent refundable tax credit on your homestead that's 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 pretty huge they've for earned veterans it. Yeah. They, they've certainly they've earned, earned it. it yeah absolutely so, and then for small businesses, now we define small businesses as uh, uh, those small businesses with assets less than a million dollars, okay? They're going to see a refundable, a 50% refundable tax credit. And uh, they're going to see uh, on all species of, uh, uh, so you would have machinery and equipment, furniture and fixtures, leasehold improvements, um, computer equipment, stuff like that. So they're going to see a 50% tax credit. So that's going to help a lot of these small businesses as well. So altogether, $754, $780 million tax cut. So, so um, Delegate, 
I know there's probably some studies that have been done, like what kind of economic activity this will stimulate by this type of cut mm-hmm. and cuts. Could you could you speak on that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've said it many times on this radio station that we have so many of our citizens, they're leaving the state in search of prosperity. They're they're going south. They're going to the southwest. They're going to the west, and they're basically they're voting with their feet and we see those states like north carolina florida texas we're seeing all those states that have no income tax you know uh actually uh, excel because uh so we need to stop that drain of our good people leaving the state in search of prosperity now if we can get ourselves into a point where we've eliminated the personal income tax low enough we could have the lowest personal income tax from new hampshire to the florida line uh, right now, Pennsylvania, our neighbor to the north, has a personal income tax of 3.07%. Right now, we're lower than uh, Kentucky. We're lower than Virginia. Uh, Tennessee has no personal income tax. So, you know, we're getting closer, and we just got to stay on that uh, pathway if you want to see more prosperity in the state of West Virginia. Way lower than Maryland, I can tell you that. Yeah, I mean, even our high income tax rate uh, that we had at 6.5%, we're now at 5.12 with the new rates. But um, just think about it, at 6.5%, if you in, if you lived in West Virginia making $60,000 combined, and, which is not enough, uh, not a lot of money, I mean, your wife could make 30000 you can make 30000 you were in our highest tax bracket in West Virginia. But in Maryland, in order to be in a six and a half tax bracket, you had to make at least, I believe, it was like one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So, Maryland has a piggyback tax too for the counties that West Do Virginia they? doesn't have either. Right. So, the top tax rate there in Maryland is like eight and three quarter percent three quarter or something percent. like that. Once well, you're out of the county tax, Rob, we welcome you to West Virginia, the land of opportunity. <laughs> so, if I have anything left by the time I, <laughs> if I can pay the moving company, right? Uh, House Majority Leader Eric Householder is our guest here on the program. And uh, Eric, is there going to be another push to simplify? the personal property tax rebate plan in terms of another run at amendment two so that it's just no longer an accounting issue on your taxes it's just gone there could be there could be um i know a lot of people thought well this is uh, it may not be a very clean way to do it but remember uh the way that this um the personal property taxes right now if you pay your bill on time there's no loss of revenue to the counties okay counties are getting their money up front no loss to them um, is it going to be complicated? No, you're going to get a tax receipt. Uh, yes, you have to file your state income tax uh, taxes. But uh, I, I, the, the answer to your question is I really don't know. There could be a push. But I think we're going to see. Uh, let's just take a look and let's wait and see. I think the governor's right. Let's, let's, let's pursue one tax cut first and do it right and then see how well it works. And then if we have the extra revenue, proceed with other tax cuts. I'm going to ask you a veto question here. Yes. The governor vetoed the legislative oversight of the SSA CC, making them a government entity, and he lined that one out. Will you folks reconvene to override that veto, or are you going to let it rest? Probably let it rest, and we'll just bring it up next year. And that was the only bill that uh, the governor actually vetoed. In fact, uh, uh, I didn't even hear the word veto in any of his uh, breath. <laughs> I mean, that was actually the only bill that he actually vetoed. Now, I believe there were like six or eight bills that did become law that he just allowed to become law without a signature uh, but for the most part there were uh, my memory 2300 bills introduced uh, 333 of them made um, uh, completed legislation and of those 333 203 of them were house bills and 130 of them were senate bills all right so, less stressful less yeah. less uh, uh, destructive on the internals being the house finance chair or yes. the house majority leader you know, I really, really do love the, the role of the House Finance Chair. I mean, this kind of stuff I just you know, enjoy to do. Uh, but my role did change this year. And um, praise God that uh, I had good people around me. I, I know I'm getting a lot of credit for, you know, having a good session. But uh, I also was able to pick good people around me. Uh, one of the things that I did early on, I told the speaker, I, I'd, I'd like to have key individuals. And, and I named who I wanted. Uh, I had Marty Gearhart. Uh, as our majority whip, Paul Espinoza as our speaker pro tem, uh, and myself, uh, I feel we three could you know, lead the caucus in, in a good way that would pres- that would uh, you know, give us good results. And then I told the speaker I wanted some assistant leaders, so I picked David Kelly, uh, Dean Jeffries, and Laura Kimball, three strong conservatives. 
And then with Marty Gearhart, our, our whip out of Mercer County, um, we gave him two assistants like uh, Chris Pritt and Erica Storch. And Erica was more like uh, a den mother, so to speak, for all the new new incoming freshmen. And speaking of that, we had 88 uh, uh, Republicans and 31 of them were new. So we had uh, some growing pains right there. And then we did morning debriefings every morning at 8 a.m. Was that new? That was new. That was new. We had a, a strong debriefing team. We had Clay Rowley. We had John Paul Hunt. And um, we had um, Smith out of uh, Mercer County, Doug Smith. And those three, those three gentlemen, they were phenomenal. So we, uh, my mantra was, hey, look, we're going to discuss it behind closed door. We're going to discuss every one of these bills. Here's your opportunity to tell us what you think. And I would try every morning to anticipate any bills that were creating a divide uh, or any bills that wasn't quite ready for the prime time uh, or any other bills that needed some other work for whatever reason. You know, I was holding those bills back until we got, you know, a, a majority of people that said, yes, OK. And, and every morning that we would have our debriefing, I said, look, I want to make sure that we have, you know, any of our arguments or disagreements behind closed door. When we get out there on the House floor, you know, it's game time, prime time. We're going to, you know, we're here. We've already made a decision. We're going to vote it up or down. And uh, that's why I tried. That's what I tried to accomplish. And I think we did a good, good thing. Uh, also, weekly, I would meet with uh, all the committee chairs of the subject matter committees and of the, uh, the major committees. And I emphasized each and every time that we had a meeting. Look, members are going to come to you. They're going to want you to run run their bills and you have a decision to make but i want you to be straightforward and honest with them you tell them you're either going to run their bill or you're not going to run their bill and give them a reason why you're not going to run their bill and if you and if you give them that reason and they can come back and they can uh, fix their bill then you have another decision to make do you want to run their bill or not and i said i want to keep the lines of communication open another thing that i did was uh, i opened up the majority leader's door to the hallway to be completely accessible and um, I wanted to make sure that people knew that, hey, at any time that they had any problems, they could come see me. And that's what really the majority leader's role is, is, is the per se traffic cop, is to try to make sure that everything is, is moving freely and uh, exponentially on the House floor without any hiccups or any problems. Now, did we have a couple of problems? Yes. Uh -huh. But uh, for the most part, everything was contained. So I was quite happy. It's been a story for a couple of years that Speaker Hanshaw doesn't want to do this for too much longer. It's possible. There yeah. is also some rumors that he might like to be the next president of WVU or a Supreme Court justice. It's very possible. That being the case, would you be interested in being the next speaker? That would be a decision of our caucus because, uh, once again, there's quite there's a lot of good members in our caucus. And uh, I would be honored, obviously, but th that's a decision that has to be made with the caucus. But you would be interested if they were interested in having <laughs> uh, you. Well, I, <laughs> should the role be open? I'm not pushing everybody well, out the door. If, just if the role would be open, possibly, yes. I mean, it's a reasonable response. Yes, I think it's a reasonable response. Yes. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I mean, I think I've earned the respect uh, of my, my colleagues and I've treated people fairly. And, you know, I do drive around with the license plate that says Tea Party, but I do have common sense to, my, to myself. So. We've got a final minute with the House Majority Leader, Delegate Eric Houseworth, coming up next.